Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Thursday, October 17, 2019 session in our series on edge computing, whether there will be different directions for Asia and the United States or not. I'm Richard Dasher. I direct the US Asia Technology Management Center at Stanford. We're very happy to produce this series, and uh, we want to thank all of our member companies for support of our series as well as support of our other activities. And please stay afterward and have some refreshments outside with us, get to meet our speakers, also get to meet representatives of our member companies. I'm very happy that uh, today we're moving into actual use cases of edge computing. So we started off, I gave an overview at the end of September. We had a presentation on 5G. We had a presentation on chip acceleration last week. So for this week, we're going to talk about a very important use case where a large amount of the information processing has to happen at the edge device, meaning, in this case, the automobile. We're going to talk about self-driving cars. Today, uh, I have with us a great panel. So closest to me is Dr. Sven Biker, and I've known Sven for years. Uh, Sven was the executive director of the CARS Lab at Stanford, the Center for Automotive Research at Stanford. Uh, however, since then, he's been an expert on mobility topics at McKinsey and Company, and most recently, he's the founding uh, managing director of Silicon Valley Mobility, which is a consultancy and advisory firm. Before he came to Stanford, he uh, worked for the BMW Group for 13 years, and uh, he has worked in Silicon Valley in Germany and in Detroit, and he received his master's and PhD degrees in mechanical engineering from the Technical University in Braunschweig, uh, Germany. He's published various technical papers and holds several patents in the area of vehicle dynamics and powertrain. And further away from me is Dr. Martin Sierhuis, and Martin is the chief technology officer of what's now called the Alliance Innovation Lab in Silicon Valley. Now, this was originally the Nissan Research Center of Silicon Valley, and Martin was the founding director. He also established their research agenda including uh, leading a team of researchers on artificial intelligence technologies for automotive vehicles, connected vehicles, and human-machine interaction. Also, uh, he spent, before he came to Nissan, he spent 12 years at NASA Ames working on human and autonomy systems for space exploration. So uh, not only how to have an autom autonomous satellite, but how to automate the work of flight controllers in uh, NASA mission control. So he has a long-term career in uh, research and software engineering. He has worked at the Palo Alto Research Center at 9X uh, Science and Technology at IBM Corporation. And he's an entrepreneur. He founded the startup company Agenta. So uh, we will ask Sven to give some comments, then we'll ask Martin to give some comments, then all three of us will come up here and have a real panel discussion. Sven, the floor is yours. Thanks. Great, thanks so much. Thanks so much for the invitation, Richard, and uh, for the introduction. And great to be on the panel with Martin then a little, bit, a little bit later on. I think we also go back like almost 10 years or so. And for this time, we've been discussing a lot when will we finally have autonomous vehicles. I'm glad we're doing this. Yes, and I'm, I'm sure we, uh, we will figure out tonight when uh, autonomous vehicles will come to the market. Uh, they might not be able to help with this journey, but that's just a little bit to highlight or to visualize, I guess, what um, Richard was just saying from introduction. Um, very nicely done. Thanks very much. Just a little bit of a rundown. As that my background, I'm a mechanical engineer. Uh, I, I really got excited about how a vehicle moves based on the forces on the four tires. So basically drive forces, braking forces, and steering forces, uh, which got me into BMW in the mid-1990s. Um, and I'm still very excited about how a vehicle moves. But I have to say that's not, in my mind, ultimately defining the future of mobility. Because it's not so much how the vehicle moves, in my mind, is much more how we get moved, how we move ourselves with vehicles, or actually how those vehicles move us. Therefore, I wandered a little bit more from 
vehicle dynamics into mobility, what I do today. And as Richard pointed out, um, spent quite some time here full time at Stanford at the Center for Automotive Research, then got into consulting, where I still am with my own uh, consulting firm based here in Palo Alto. And I still lecture at the Stanford Business School. And um, I was just uh, discussing earlier when we were walking in here that I still have to grade a few papers tonight. <laughs> because at the business school, we have these compressed schedules where we only have the first two weeks to teach and then two weeks for the students to write their papers. And the papers are all about what can incumbents do in order to remain relevant in the automotive industry and what can newcomers do in order to get into the automotive industry. And that's quite interesting, like disruption and innovators dilemma and all of these things. So all of this basically telling you there's an engineer here uh, speaking to you right now, but I also, I guess, have gotten my fingers dirty in the business uh, of things. And so therefore, I, I profoundly believe just a great engineering solution does not make ultimately for market success because really there are different things that need to come together. Obviously technology and business, but also then regulation. The customer should not be forgotten and certainly environmental concerns should not be forgotten. Many of these things we hope to actually address and maybe ultimately solve uh, with autonomous driving. So therefore I thought um, I might talk a little bit more about how an autonomous vehicle might work. Martin will then give us also a lot of insight into all the data that's being generated. And then all together, all together we will discuss what does edge computing have to do with it. A little bit about um, the, the autonomous car. That's, believe it or not, it's a slide. I think I created it, you can maybe tell, created it like eight, nine years ago for my class. Uh, I think it was over there in the Earth Sciences building, the future of the automobile. And we were discussing, well, how does it actually work? And so I came up with this little animation. I hope uh, that it's still helpful for you to, to understand. When you get in one of these autonomous cars, you need to tell it actually something. And you better tell it where's the destination, where do you want to go to? Can be a user interface, where you see the little marker number eight, where you say, that's where I want to go. And then the autonomous car basically says, OK, I got you on, um, on a map. I know where we are. And we basically can be very precise with a lot of sensors to improve our position accuracy that we really know exactly where we are on the planet. And then we could actually get going because we know where we want to go to. We know where we are. And we basically know what the map, what the lay of the land looks like. Let's plan a route. Guess what? Problem might be there are obstacles in the route. The environment, which can be other vehicles, can be pedestrians, can be obstacles, something that is not in the map, all of a sudden it shows up uh, in front of the vehicle. This is where all these uh, sensors come in, one, two, and three. So you can see here, laser sensors, cameras, and, and radar sensors. Uh, this is where Martin, I believe, will have quite some insights, how much data they actually generate, and where we will then have a discussion, where should we process all this data? Uh, but what we actually do now that we figured out, I know where I am, I know basically what the routes are, and now I know where I want to go to, but there's an obstacle, now we can actually get a little bit more uh, reactive about our routing and plan a maneuver like you, I actually need to go around this obstacle and then maybe even get somewhat tactical what is the actual path. Is it like do I want to cut the corner a little bit or do I want to swing a little bit wider because it's a pedestrian or a bicyclist where I don't want to get too close and um, so we get these different steps and then we're almost done. This is now the later part where my heart actually is like the four uh, forces on the tires. You apply basically turning through the steering system, deceleration with the brakes, and acceleration with the by wire system. That doesn't really matter technically, actually, if it's an electric car or a combustion engine, gasoline powered vehicle. Today, everything is computer controlled in the vehicles, and you can just command, I need 150 Newton meters now. And you basically get it a little bit faster from an electric engine or electric motor than from a combustion, but still. But let's not forget, you also want to share some information. As much as the person in the vehicle who's no longer the driver, but the person in the vehicle needs to enter 
his or her destination of choice, you also need to reply back, yes, we will get there in 26 minutes. And you might also need to communicate even more, you know what, we have to slow down a little bit because there's a challenging traffic situation here, which is um, what also quite some research here on Stanford campus uh, has happened. So, so that's basically how an autonomous car works. You can cluster all these things a little bit further and also throw a, a few um, company logos onto here. Who's actually in this field? And if you look at it, for one, okay, we can talk about these three categories, and we will, but you don't see any car company. You don't see a GM, you don't see a Ford, you don't see a BMW, my former employer. Toyota is not on there. And that's not that they would not matter. It's a little bit too obvious. But therefore, one should state it even more. What this becomes now is really like a lot of new technology that we need to integrate into probably existing vehicles. Some also say, yeah, you know what, now that we get an autonomous car and no one actually is going to be in there and driving anymore, let's start really from scratch. And there are quite a few companies here. Zooks, I think, should be pointed out. Um, Neuro, which is more the delivery vehicle, let's say, you know what, we are not just going from automobile 1.0 to 2.0, we're really reinventing mobility and that should probably not be within the existing thinking what an automobile is. So there, there are these companies that say, okay, autonomous vehicle in a completely new shell and maybe even completely new business model. But then there are these companies that maybe are a little bit better known. Aurora is being talked about a lot. Too Simple is uh, building autonomous driving stack, as it's called, for trucks. Drive AI got a little bit quieter uh, out of Stanford, um, or at least Stanford graduates uh, out of the CS program started that company. They got acquired by Apple over summer. Uh, Pony.ai is talked about a lot, and a few others here as well. So these are those who basically say, we mostly focus on software. What does it actually mean if we say, okay, we do a path planning, we do a maneuver, we do some more technical um, driving um, strategies, if you will. That all happens in here. Talked about the full vehicle. Let's talk about perception. That's obviously, by and large, the largest group here. And, and that is um, somewhat indicative, I guess, of, of the action, maybe of the investment as well that goes into it. There's a lot here in, in LiDAR, which is, again, laser sensing, where Velodyne, Quantigy, Blackmore, companies that are talked about a lot. Um, but just don't be, don't be deceived here. They are, what is that, like seven, eight logos on there. Like people who do this for a living, who scan the market, what's going on in startup land and in technology innovators, they are tracking close to 100 LiDAR companies. It's LiDAR companies just by itself. About 100. And I'm not saying that that's exhaustive. I, I don't have that spreadsheet, but someone was telling me already three years ago, no, we're looking at 75. And then someone said, no, we look more like 90. So it must be about 100 plus or minus in this field. Camera and computer vision. Um, one company that is, is maybe missing here is um, Mobileye. Not sure if we have them anywhere else. But that's basically where people say, you know what, we do all of this with cameras. Because cameras are actually the only ones that can detect a traffic light. Because a laser beam cannot really tell if it's green or red. And once we get to radar down here, radar can also not detect is a traffic light green or red. But I assume all of you will agree it actually does matter a lot if a traffic light is <laughs> green or red. Uh, so therefore, a lot of work on cameras as well. Radar, um, Meta Wave, actually just a uh, uh, stone throw here from campus. And there's a lot of work here in, in the local Bay Area as well. There are obviously others. And uh, you might ask, well, well, no, I get the camera idea, but laser and radar, isn't that all a little bit overkill? Maybe yes, maybe no. This is where a lot of the discussion is still happening. What actually do we need in order to detect a person? A person to detect a person, a camera might be good, 
but then you don't really know what exactly is the person doing. So if you really want to see if the person is walking or maybe just standing, you actually might need to detect the extremities and say, well, that's an arm and the arm goes like this, probably that person is walking. You might even need to, believe it or not, detect where the person's nose is. Which sounds like, well, really, Sven, are you not getting carried away here? But if you just think about it, I'm a pedestrian. This is the curbside. This is where the autonomous car comes, OK? It makes a big difference if I'm standing like this or like this and waving to Martin. Because as I'm waving to Martin, it's unlikely that I walk like this, <laughs> right? But if I stand like this, very likely that I would step into the street. And that tells us something, what we are about to do here. As we want to get these self-driving cars, what they are called quite often as well, if we want to insert these self-driving cars in the traffic as we know it, it needs to get all these little cues. It might even be something, and I'm not making this up. Maybe the sports code, maybe that says something. Because if that's maybe sports code, maybe with a logo on there, and there are five other people with the same sports code and the logo, very likely that they belong to them. If the five people with the same sports code on the other side of the road, very likely they belong to them. They don't want to interact with them. This is how we drive. And that's what we need to get into the system. And this is where we can say, yeah, that is great in order to see color and maybe get an idea of what is that um, object all about. This is a lot about the geometry, where we say extremities and all of that, exactly how big something is. But guess what? Same as our eyes don't work very well in uh, bad weather conditions, same as cameras and LiDAR doesn't work too well, very heavy rain, snowfall, and the likes. This is where radar is very good. So which is why many people say, you know, we need this sense of fusion. We really need to make sure that we can safely detect what it is that we're looking at. Then there's other, I uh, don't want to go too much into detail. Simulation is a pretty big topic because we're saying, how many miles do we need to drive in order to say, now it's safe enough? Big debate. No answer yet. Some people say, for a number of reasons, 100 million miles you need to drive in order to say, now it's safe enough. Others say, and I would agree with them, even 100 million miles are not enough. How long might it take to drive 100 million miles? You say you might have a fleet of 100 vehicles, but still driving a million miles it takes a long time. So therefore, simulation is very important here. And then V2X systems. This is then what we're getting into, what we will discuss here a little bit later, also through Martin's presentation. Vehicle to X, vehicle to everything else. So that's all connectivity. Like, how do you get data to and from this autonomous car? Localization, that's something that I had on the previous slide where I went relatively briefly over the map. <coughs> but the map is not just the map. It's not just the map like, OK, there's like a two-lane highway that basically goes from whatever San Jose to San Francisco, and you're on it or not. It's much more what exactly is the curvature of this uh, highway. It's exactly where's a, even a tree, where's a, where's a building. Because if I see this tree, I know, well, that thing at least is not going to move, which actually does make a difference. Because in challenging conditions, a tree that's maybe this tall is not too <coughs> different from a person in one of these uh, perception systems. So therefore, as much as you can tell, this is a stationary object that does not move. It's very important to know. Therefore, localization and maps are really important. And even the precision, uh, precision that we need for localization is very important. Today, standard GPS gets you, well, we say about 30, maybe 15 feet on a, on a, on a good day of accuracy. That is not enough to have a self-driving car. Because you really need to know which lane are you in on the road. Because you can still have something like with your, with your camera, you know, if you are in between like the lane markings and everything. But you also need to know, OK, I am in this lane. That's actually the lane that takes a left turn. It's not the lane that goes straight, because it does make a big difference. So all of this we need to know. And um, I think I will come to a close here pretty soon, because timing is um, 
of essence here. We definitely want to reserve enough time for uh, your questions as well. <laughs> but I, I want to close then with um, one thing which I created because I got upset <coughs> when people say, ah, oh, you know what? A car will just be a computer on wheels. And I, you really don't know anything because <laughs> a car today is about 100 computers and sensors on wheels already. So everything that you see here, you can read for yourself, like transmission, engine, surroundings, weather, driver input, all of that is already computer controlled. This is connected by, I think the number is somewhere on here, up to 20 communication networks within the vehicle. Which is why I say, well, you know what, I got into the automotive industry as a mechanical engineer thinking that I can really define what a car is, which we still can. I mean, mechanical engineering is still very important. But there's so much computer controlled already in the vehicle, which adds to the complexity where today, if an automobile company launches a new car, mastering that complexity really becomes the challenge and ultimately defines success very often. But it also tells us that's all this information that's already in there in the vehicle. Like if someone sits on the seat or not, or what the temperature setting is, like door locks and everything, certainly steering wheel and brake application and all of that. And into this architecture, we now need to integrate the autonomous car, which might evolve out of this. So that's one direction. That's a more an evolutionary approach, which is what we discussed in length in my class at the business school. Or it might be a disruptive or revolutionary approach where we say, you know what? Let's do away with all of this. Let's build like an autonomous car from scratch. What we saw in the previous slide, there are companies that have this belief. I cannot say that they are wrong, but building an entire car from scratch without much experience should not be underestimated. So we shall see, but one thing is for sure, uh, these cameras and radar and LIDAR and everything existing in the car generates a lot of data. I think that's what Martin will tell us a little bit more about. How's that? Sounds Good. great. Sven, thank you. Good. You're welcome. Sven, while we're changing machines, yes. can I ask you kind of one follow-up question? Of course you may. So in terms of sort of technology developments, the really recent thing, one of the questions I'm curious about, this last slide you showed about the you know, incredible computer systems, plural, yes. in a car, all the wires, do you see movement to make the inside of the car wireless? Not, not too much, and I, I don't want to sound like someone who said, yeah, tried that, didn't work, but still a little bit of uh, inside baseball. It was one of the projects that I got at BMW yeah. in 2003 or something like that. Yeah. And so wireless sensor networks in a car, it, it doesn't really apply that much because in a car you basically know exactly where a sensor is. Yeah. It's exactly on the top of the vehicle and it scans the environment. It's going to sit there for the life of the car. And it certainly needs power. And, so why would and wireless you actually, tend to yeah. have problems so with So we couldn't really so come forth. up with something wireless. Yeah. I mean, where wireless applies are tires because yeah. they yeah. obviously spin. And so that, this is where it applies. Or for, for testing or something like this. Okay. So we did say, you know what? Someone brings the vehicle into a workshop in a, in a dealership. Something rattles and screeches and is not right on my car, and it's only Thursday mornings. So I don't know. Okay. Well, we get your wireless sensor kit just to check it out, and then we do a little bit like the 24-hour, uh, uh, what is that, heart rate monitor or something. Okay, like sounds okay? good. Let sure. you and me sit down. And, yes, and that's that. Martin, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, still. Um, I'm Martin Sierhaus. Um, Richard did a wonderful introduction. Um, I don't know if there's anything more I need to say. Like uh, Richard said, I, I run the research at, uh, at the Alliance Research Center. Um, we started as the Nissan Research Center, but as you all know, uh, Nissan is in an alliance with Renault and Mitsubishi, so we are like an alliance center now. Uh, that means that we work for all companies uh, in the alliance. Um, my startup is in healthcare, so completely different, but also about autonomy. So. Um, Anybody interested in that? I'm not talking about that, but you can ask me questions later on. Um, let me start with asking how many people, you know, Sven gave kind of like an overview of autonomous vehicle. How many people really know the technical insights of an autonomous vehicle? OK. 
Okay, so it's still a lot of people that don't. So, you know, because um, I don't want to overwhelm you with with technology and you know all details. So, so I just wanted to see where shall I stay in, in, in my uh, discussions. Um, so I, I titled my um, you know my talk uh, autonomous systems with human in the loop because this is my this is the pet peeve for me. Um, like uh, Richard said, I, I worked uh, at NASA for more than 12 years as a senior scientist. And one of the things that I learned there is there, uh, you know, I, I have said, show me an autonomous system without a human in the loop, and I'll show you a useless system. All right? Literally, what is useless? What is useless? A useless system, a system that is useless. And um, you know, I had debates uh, with um, our scientists at Ames early in the or in the late 1990s about uh, autonomous spacecraft, and so you know, it was obvious that it was easier if we just take the human out of the loop, right? And I said, okay, so now your spacecraft grows to the edge of the universe, and then what? Oh no, it's going to communicate information back, and I'm like, well, there's a human then, right? So if you don't have a human in there, why are you sending the spacecraft? So the same thing I say with autonomous systems here on Earth, right? And, and this counts for autonomous vehicles. It you know, counts for any autonomy that you have. There was always a human in the loop. And, and this, to me, is a very important aspect um, to keep in mind when, when we talk about autonomy and autonomous systems on you know, uh, uh, driving around. I mean, I always say, how, how do we imagine to have millions of autonomous vehicles driving around on the road without humans in the loop. We have, well, in the United States airspace, about 6,000 airplanes in the sky at one time. And we have air traffic controllers talk, well, two, two pilots in the cockpit, mind you. And we have air traffic controllers talking to the pilots all the time. Right? Why do we think we can have millions of autonomous vehicles driving around? Nobody needs to interact with them. OK, so, so that's my start. Um, and then I say the role of edge and cloud computing. And, and we'll get to that why, but one of the, you know, just as a start, one of the things is that humans are not just in the car, all right? <laughs> Most of the humans are not in the car. <laughs> and so we need to be able to communicate and interact with humans not in the car. And as, as Sven was saying, you know, V to X, so communicating, communicating from the vehicle to outside is a very important part of building autonomous vehicles. And we'll talk about that. So the human in the loop, why do we do this? Why do I say that? And that's because of this slide, right? This is our vision. It's about what I call socially acceptable autonomy. Right? If I build autonomous system that nobody likes, and we have millions of them driving on the road, that's not going to create a nice environment, right? And so. Now, of course, we can debate about what does it mean to be socially acceptable. I don't want to go into that today, but I just want you to see that what we say, it's an equation. You know, it's about human and robot teamwork. This is what we're talking about. This is, you know, the robot needs to be interacting with humans. To do that, we need AI. Everybody agrees with that. But we need AI that can explain what it's doing to humans. Right? Otherwise, we're going to get all kinds of problems in another talk I gave recently, I talked about the 737 MAX accident in the cockpit. That's an example of what problems you get when AI can't explain itself. Right? And to be socially acceptable, we, have, we need social science to understand how humans behave in order for the vehicle and for, for autonomy systems to understand how, humans, how to interact with humans. So this, to me, is really what it's all about, to develop vehicles that are socially acceptable. We need to have explainable AI, and we need to be able to understand humans. And so people from the social sciences are very important to understand that. Let me give you a little video. Uh, for those who know autonomous vehicles can understand why I'm showing this vehicle. For those who don't, I, I just put yourself into, as the driver into this vehicle that you see. You see an image coming from the front of our autonomous vehicle in Mountain View. And I, this video is uh, meant to show how what we call level four and level five autonomy, which is fully autonomous systems, are so incredibly difficult. So this is a 
intersection uh, in Castro Street. What we see here is the traffic lights are flickering, right? You see this truck, right? The truck is going, and you see all kinds of construction going on. We have already given up in driving in autonomous mode by now, right? And you understand this. Now, just watch this scene, right? This car is coming here. Right? The car doesn't know what to do. People are walking around, stops in the middle of the road. That, uh, you know, that backhoe is, I don't know what it's doing. This car, oh, this car just goes, <laughs> right? Um, here's a bicyclist, you know. Now you think, okay, now I'm, I'm gonna go. Oops, that car is just taking a left-hand turn suddenly, and so he goes. Now watch the guy there on the side, right? You think he's, he's, he's taking away cones, or he's replacing cones, and then boom, he just crosses the road. Okay. So. Is that the highest level of autonomy? Well, well since we, we it was a human driving, so yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I have my water? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, there ain't no autonomous vehicle in the world that can do this. Okay, let me just say that. It doesn't exist. Anybody who tells you that we can do this is just, you know, it, this, we cannot do this today. No company, nobody. Um, so that just to, to set the level of where we are with autonomy, right? And, and how difficult this is. And this is just a, a Wednesday morning in, in Mountain View, right? They ain't, this, is, this is still in San Francisco. You know, this is not Tokyo. This is just Mountain View, little, little uh, Mountain View. All right. So. What is, what is it about the future, right, where, where we want to go? And I, you know, we say it's, like, it's the future of connected and <coughs> autonomous vehicles because we're not going to do, boom, tomorrow everybody drives autonomous. So we're going to have connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles. And it's really to design a world of connected and autonomous vehicles with onboard and offboard intelligence, right? So the intelligence cannot just live on board the vehicle, right? To solve this problem of this intersection, we need to know that there is construction there. We need to know that the traffic lights aren't working, right? That we should not expect that there is the normal rules of the road that are going. We need that information from somewhere. That is intelligence that is not on board. So what it's really about is, this is the intelligence on board, what Sven was talking about. What I say is we need intelligence in the cloud to communicate information about the state of the world and about issues that the car you know, faces from humans in the control center. We need to be able to connect to humans in traffic management centers. Maybe there is a traffic management center for the Bay Area. <coughs> Doesn't exist. <laughs> All right, um, you know, Palo Alto has a little bit of some traffic lights that are controlled with us, you know, then we have Mountain View that has their own little thing, and then Sunnyvale has something. Do you think they talk to each other? No, they don't talk to each other, right? Where we go actually to do research about traffic management centers, we go to Europe. You know, Europe has a way better system. Um, you know, the, for instance, the country in the Netherlands has somewhere in, in one province about the size of the Bay Area. There's somewhere around 1,500 traffic lights. They're all connected, right? They're all, this, this is all, this all works. They have, you know, information coming. We can get the data. Here, no, not so much. So, but we need that. And then we get to smart cities, right? We need infrastructures. Would be nice if we would have a LiDAR on the intersection that we just looked, you know, saw the video from. So we can get information from that intersection about the objects, about the backhoe that was there, you know, about the cones that were on there. Would be nice if, if we would have that information off the vehicle for a couple of reasons. The vehicle could have known that before it went through the intersection and decided like, mm, maybe not such a good idea to go there. Maybe I should reroute myself. Um, or it could be that, oh, maybe I don't need that expensive LiDAR on the vehicle anymore. The infrastructure provides that information, therefore my vehicle becomes cheaper, right? So this is the game that we need to play, but it's really about sharing the intelligences in these systems. 
And as they already say, we don't have this in the Bay Area, right? How long is it going to take before we have this in the Bay Area? Well, I'll probably uh, you know, be in a wheelchair that is autonomous by, by the time we have that. So it, it's going to be a while before we, we have that. So it's going to be piecemeal. But this is what we're after. And this is where I want to go um, with the next thing. The, the, the next slide is to show you, as I already showed you in the video, we can't handle every situation. Um, but we still want to have autonomous vehicle before the AI is smart enough to handle those kind of situations. So how do we do this in the next five years? Right? Um, I say we need human intelligence. And let me show you an example of what I mean. Um, what you're going to see is um, the car streaming all its sensor data to the cloud in real time. And I say to the edge, right? Because time delay is really now starts to become an issue here. So we've worked with NASA Ames to develop a system to inter interact with the car in a way that NASA interacts with robots on Mars. And one, one, thing, to, one thing to to think about uh, what we're not doing. What can't you do with interacting with a robot on Mars? Anybody? Any clue? Uh, let me, let me you, know. you can't drive the vehicle in real time. Okay? I can't sit in my living room here and steer and give gas, and 30 minutes later on Mars, the rover receives my command and does something. The time delay is, is, simil is, is, is just too long. So that's not how we're driving vehicles. Right? It's very dangerous, in my opinion, to drive vehicles remotely. Right? If we already have 3,400 well, how many? 34,000 deaths in the United States by people inside the car? <laughs> you know, how, how, how many deaths will we have if we put people somewhere else? Right? That's not the solution. So we don't drive the vehicle remotely. What we do is we observe what the vehicle does, and we give direction to the vehicle. We give commands, and then the vehicle com autonomously executes those commands. We say, we give the vehicle go, no-go decisions. Right? That's what the human intelligence is. So let me show you an example of how that looks. Um, so here you see half the screen. This is our, um, an image of the car driving. You see that the, the vehicle has noticed an obstruction in the road. It sends information. It now streams in real time its LIDAR, its, its cameras to the person. And it says here, I want to go around this vehicle. There's like, if you look here, there's two cars parked and somebody walking, you know, working there. There's a double yellow line that means you can't go around it because that's not allowed. So do, will we allow uh, autonomous vehicles to just go around whenever they want over a double yellow line? No. So what do we need? We need a human to give a go, no go decision. And let me just show you how that works. So I think I jumped. So here, there is an, the user says authorized. It sends it to the vehicle. The vehicle plants around around it, and it goes. Hmm? We need many humans. Hmm? We need many humans to... So this is a very good point. So if we now need one human for one car, we haven't won very much, <laughs> right? So this is this is then we might as well have the human in the car. Exactly. So that's not what we're proposing. What we're proposing is something like this, just like air traffic control, or most of you probably don't realize, if you take the bus in San Francisco, for every four buses, there is a controller in a control room somewhere continuously talking to all the bus drivers to make sure that, oh, the passenger just got sick in the bus. What do I do? Oh, I can't get to the bus stop. What do I do? Right? There is continuous communication between bus drivers and a control center. This is a similar idea, right? Is that we would have a control center with a person maybe controlling, well, what we hope, at least 100 vehicles, right? So, you, we, you know, so the game is really how can we get this, um, this work system, as I call it, between vehicles and control center, how can we make that as efficient so you need as few people to manage vehicles, uh, a fleet of vehicles on the road? Just like we do with airplanes. So, why don't we let 
evil drive the car? What is the benefit of doing it? Well, we can discuss that in our panel. <laughs> you know, hold your hold your thought. You know, um, but this is one concept that we have developed um, and we're working on, um, and we call this a mobility manager. And it's personnel responsible for safe and orderly and expeditious flow of robot fleets in the global traffic system. All right. So to do that, what do we need? All right. Um, we need both for autonomous vehicles and for connected vehicles, an edge, right? If we want to have fast communication, be nice if we have 5G. Today we don't have 5G, so we need to do this over 4G, which makes remote driving even more dangerous. Um, but so we need pipes going to the cloud where there is AI and analytics that can take all the video and all the information from all the cars streaming their sensor data. We can learn from that sensor data. Um, we want to be able to go from vehicle to infrastructure, so vehicle to vehicle, um, vehicle to you know, um, traffic lights, uh, to pedestrians, right? If you have a cell phone and you send GPS, be nice if I can use that GPS to know where you are, just like uh, Sven was saying, and maybe predict where you might be going. Um, sharing of data with other businesses, the mobility sensor, uh, the center, um, and, and connected vehicles we don't leave alone. So this is kind of the, the architecture that we need to de develop and create. And this is where edge computing becomes very valuable. Because if I need to have my mobility center you know, for San Francisco and the cloud where the computers run are somewhere in New York, the time delay alone to send the data from the car to New York and back over the internet to my car might be too long. So maybe we want an edge right, in the San Francisco Bay Area for the mobility center of the San Francisco Bay Area. If I want to do fast processing of images from my vehicle, right, I might want to have it very close in the intersection. So maybe there is an edge in the intersection to make an intersection smart for me to communicate that way. So this is where we are really starting to think about how does this architecture of computing, communications, and intelligence, where does the intelligent live? So you, in, in essence, right, what I, what I always say is like, look, do we really want a million of data centers driving around? You know, do we all need to see the same data? You know, if I have 15 cars in an intersection, they all process the same intersection data. Is that really what we want? Is that really efficient? They, they all need the same computers. They all process the same images. That seems inefficient to me. That processing should be done somewhere else, right? That shouldn't be done on the cloud, uh, on the car. All right. So, one of the reasons I say that is because of the following. So this is kind of the same picture that uh, Sven has. So these are the car with its sensors. It has CAN data. CAN, CAN bus is one of those uh, networks that. Uh, Sven was talking about in the car. It has sensor data from these sensors. It goes through the autonomous system. This is a, a high-level picture of an autonomous system. We have sensing with perception. We have the world model, which are all the objects that we see in the world. Uh, we know what, where we are ourselves. We have the map. We have decision-making. We have control. We have I.O. to store this data in the cloud. right? And here are, here are all the sensors and the CAN bus that generate data. So how much data is generated? So this is my back of the envelope calculation of one of our vehicles at Nissan. Right? We have 15 cameras, we have two LIDARs, we have one radar, we have one GPS, and we have a CAN bus. And total, it generates 140.2 megabytes per second. OK, so then I did some calculation. So that means in one minute driving, it generates 10 gigabytes. That means in 10 minutes driving, it generates 100 gigabytes. In an hour driving, 500 gigabytes. In 24 hours driving, 12 terabytes of data. Right? So then I did some more calculation. I said, OK, what does Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Facebook have? They have total of today, they say 1.2 million terabytes or 1.2 petabytes. 100,000 AVs will generate that in 24 hours. 
Okay, so 100 AVs will generate as much data as Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Facebook have today together. So I did some more calculations for you. So there are 264 million vehicles in the US today. That's 3,168 3, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebooks worth of data every 24 hour. <laughs> All right? So um, I hope the edge is a big edge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 24 hours is one day, yes. So the On Mars, it's 24 hours and 37 the minutes. But this car's equivalent to what one day, equivalent to what is generated by all the world. Yes. In one day. Now, I mean, not every piece of data we need to save, not every piece of data we want, you know, so I'm not going to argue here that this is all data we need to store in the cloud. Of course not. I mean, that's not, I mean, that would be impossible, right? But I just, e even if I cut 50%, <laughs> right? Uh, even if I cut 20%, even if it's just 10% of this number, it's still a lot of data. Right? I mean, and we need to use that data to learn, we need to store it, we need to send it, communicate it. It's a lot. So, my last slide is not to scare you completely, if I've not scared you enough. The 3168 terabyte terabyte. Byte. Well, this one, 3168. It's just. Terabyte. This number of, number number of, of all these uh, Googles together. Terabyte, terabyte. So, um, not to scare you even more, but I hope that um, somebody is thinking about privacy and security of all this data. Um, I used this, uh, this paper by Bloom et al. Um, about privacy uh, uh, and security at the USENIX conference in 2017. Um, so basically, um, we're building data sensors with cameras and sensors that drive around our city, and we will have every image that you can imagine from everybody in the city walking around, driving around, doing whatever they want to do um, is part of those, you know, the terabytes of data we, we capture. And there's four, you know, these aspects of privacy invasive technologies, right, that the security industry has known for a long time, right? Um, it, it's ubiquitous capture of data in public, right? That's what we're doing. It's physical surveillance by a privately owned company if this data is stored somewhere that is owned by a company. Uh, the ability to scale without additional infrastructure, right? I just add another car and I have more data, right? Um, I don't want to have a, a negative view here, but if, you know, if some organization says, I want data, they just buy a number of autonomous vehicles, let them drive around, they have all the data they want for a particular situation. Right? Difficult of notice and choice about data practices for physical sensors that capture data about non-users. You as a pedestrian have no choice right, but to be filmed by the autonomous vehicle. Right. These are things we should call, you know, comparisons are, of course, CCTVs, dash cams, Google Street View. These are all technologies that we are developing as a society that capture data about you as an individual. And what we need is privacy standards and regulations, but of course, technology always outpaces that, right? Um, so there is a habituation to lack of privacy that's going on today in society. And one can wonder if that's good or bad. I don't want to say anything, you know, uh, which side you want to lean on. Um, this is something that we as a society uh, in the world need to grapple with and need to deal with. Um, but fair information and privacy practices, I think we really need to um, think about. And if we think about edge computing, right, if we think about 5G and edge computing, the amount of data that can be stored and can be communicated within, you know, seconds is enormous. And so it's not just autonomous vehicles that have this issue. It's going to be everything that we're going to develop from in the home to on the street to infrastructure 
to autonomous vehicles. Okay, that's it. Martin, why don't you take the seat closest to the, the stage? I'm going to start off by asking a question to both of our panelists, and it kind of comes into the whole incumbents versus newcomers thing. So up until now, the automobile companies have each individually kept extremely tight controls over anything needed to interface into their car systems. And just last summer, Baidu announced that they were going to create an operating system for autonomous vehicles. They call it Apollo. And I'm curious how you see the whole idea of a third-party operating system working. Will this change the relationship between incumbents and newcomers? And specifically, Martin, how do you see the operating system caused? I know some of the Chinese companies have been using it, but is anybody using it outside of China? Sven, you go first. Apollo? Yeah. Yeah, that's Baidu Apollo. And there's also some sort of a competitor, which is called AutoWare, which is a foundation, and as much I understand, an open source project. Now, where's so that from? It's, uh, the foundation is based in Japan. OK. But it's an international global consortium, if you will. OK. And remains to be seen who, who's going to win, both of pluses and minuses, as always. But to, to your question, is there going to be a universal operating system for these autonomous vehicles? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> let, but let, me, let, me, let me peel the onion a little bit. Um, what, what Martin was showing, um, it's not on there anymore, but what's running the CAN bus, that was pushed largely by an automobile um, supplier, Bosch, mm -hmm. uh, back in the 1980s, I believe. Because it was realized, you know what, we're putting in electronic um, uh, fuel injection and we're putting in brake controllers, ABS and the likes, and all of these need to work together somehow. Let's implement CAN, Controller yeah. Area Network. Not quite an operating system, but also an architecture. And so it's not completely new to the industry. It obviously bears the question what consultants then always get excited about, who's holding the control point? Yeah. Right. So who's in control of things? It is definitely safe to say that the automotive industry and the, um, the, 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 the balance of power is shifting. Mm -hmm. I do not think that it's going some sort of black or white. There's new players. Uh, there will be laggards who are not getting the message uh, and, and therefore falling behind. Um, definitely Chinese companies, I think, have a very strong play in this. It is for one because they are extremely talented, uh, skillful, and ambitious researchers and, and industry engineers and business people at play. And I'm sure that in this seminar, you've also been discussing politics uh, across the Pacific. Uh, so it is um, pointed out as, as one of the key objectives to really exercise leadership in a key industry, in the automotive industry, is seen as one. So it's a pretty long answer. It's not uh, razor sharp. I do realize this. But there's going to be some sort of a standard evolving uh, that will need to leave some flexibility for a volume product versus like a high-end, maybe premium product. And China is definitely be yeah, part okay. of the mix. I may come back to you with a few I'm things sure about will. the Chinese makers. Good. I noticed that Pony.ai was one of yes. the ones you had on your slide. <laughs> Martin, first of all, though, how do you see the operating system kind of from the software side and especially open, open API, mm -hmm. that kind of thing? Yeah, so my, my background, I, I don't have such a long background in automotive industry as Sven has. Um, you know, basically, Nissan Research Center is it for me. But um, what I've noticed um, that, um, and, and rightfully so, the OEMs are incredibly safety conscious. Right, so everything is about safety. Um, now, from a software, you know, I'm more a software guy, right? Um, we all know that um, software goes where, where people who use software want it to go. And so open source has, has proven to be a pretty um, efficient way of building actually reliable software, 
strangely enough. Everybody in the beginning said like, oh, open source software is dangerous. I know at NASA they didn't want, you know, I actually have software running in Mission Control, and when we had to show what software we had, all the open source software had to be taken out, right? <laughs> um, and as researchers, Not you know, what do you use? Around. Open source software, you know, so it's like, but um, what we have shown, like, what a model that works really well is uh, the, the Red Hat model, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the, there will become uh, an, a, a party that takes this on and makes and, and gets all the bugs out and, and, and takes this from an open source to a supported version, right? That the tier ones might be able to start using. I let mean, me, one, let, one me, thing let me ask a quick question. How many people know Red Hat? Yeah, I okay. think, I think most, go. most All people. Right. So, so yeah, so Unix, right, uh, you know, became Linux, became Red, you know, Red and, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the tier, so, so OEMs don't build their own software. They use the tier ones for this. OEMs actually don't really know how to build software. So, and the, you know. Would not but, agree with that one. But. Yeah, but, you know, <laughs> well, I would even make a, a stronger statement. The tier ones don't really know how to build software because they are, you know, car makers. They are, you know, yes, they, they know how to build embedded software, but autonomy software is not something, you know, they don't have like a, a whole bunch of AI people, you know, you know, so now that and model... And this is why we see all the startup companies on and, the same yeah. slide. Yeah. So I could see a model where uh, an open source stack will become a, um, a supported stack by a, a player that then is delivered to tier ones that mm -hmm. then use that mm -hmm. to build components and systems for the OEMs. Yep. So if you ask me, that, that I see as the model that, will, that, that could happen. Right? Well, I'm going to cut to the chase. Do you see China going in a different direction than the rest of the world, or the US going in a different direction than the rest of the world? You're asking me that? Yeah. Uh, um, no, I, I think. Uh, I mean, again, this is just my opinion. I think China uh, has even less regulation or, or more regulation, depending on how you look. But it's easier in China to get technology uh, into place. And they will run into this brick wall, <laughs> right, where it's just as hard in China <laughs> as it is here. And so, you know, I, I just see, I see a similar... You know. Kind of similar evolution. Yeah, I yeah. mean, yeah. people will yeah. realize, you know, all these startups in China will realize that it's really hard. Okay, well, let's go, to, <laughs> let's go to audience questions. Go ahead, you're first. I saw you first. If you are talking about open source, then again and again you see that borders are less relevant. Uh, whatever technology you choose in open source, you see collaborations, Korea, China, everywhere. So a decision from business point of view if they're going for open source once they do that they kind of yeah but open source is one thing I have to say that this is something that is very likely to be considered dual use technology and so you're going to run into all yeah. the problems with export controls and all the problems with CFIUS you know being in charge of what kind of foreign investments a company can take uh, your point is really well taken, mm -hmm. but this is why we're living in kind of a messy world right now. Uh, I well, want to give the floor to who is uh, Managing Director for Autotech Ventures. You had a comment, question, from the investor perspective. I, I, I want to cheat. I want to ask two questions. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll let you. So, question number one, as you were showing the map, well, he said, we have a couple of portfolio companies on, on, on this map of autonomous world. So how do you see the evolution of perception versus computer or, or uh, uh, sensors versus brain? And so my analogy is, uh, as we were evolving historically, uh, uh, you, you have two different paths. You can invest in sensors, and therefore we have owls and we have bats, and they have different modalities beyond what we can do. Or you can invest in brains and have relatively narrow input mm. through the eyes and compensate the, the weakness or constraints of perception by the compute models and what we can run in a cortex. And so clearly all the biological animals have constraints, whether it's energy budget, power budget, size. In, 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 in automotive, you have constraint of again, power, energy, cost, everything else. But how do you see the trade-offs between getting more input or having more compute power? And if you project five, ten years from now, 
what those trade-offs are going to be and how the end configuration will evolve. Okay, that's, let's do that question, question first. Go ahead. So as a, as a quick answer, I would pick the brain uh, because the the sensors, so the eyes and ears and tactile sensors of the car, if you will, are in my mind already very well developed uh, because you can actually detect an object over a pretty long distance in pretty bad weather conditions. And uh, even if, if you say you, you drive out of a tunnel and there's light coming directly into the tunnel from the sun that's setting right in that direction, something like that. So that, that, that works relatively well. What does not work well at this point is really to detect safely enough what is it that I'm looking at, and even more so, what is this thing going to do within the next five seconds? Because it's not enough to say it's a person. The examples that I gave seemed maybe a little bit jokingly, but it actually wasn't. Is that person going to cross the street? But at that point, I know already that it is a person. I, I know it because the sensors are pretty good. So therefore, I think it has to be the brain. And, and therefore, for um, a number of reasons, I guess artificial intelligence is being um, um, applied to a large extent to this. I, I expect that like, the pendulum might swing a little bit back again, because uh, some seem to be relying a little bit too much on artificial intelligence. And that was to Martin's point that, that he brought up, like explainable artificial intelligence, but I think in the end I, I would pick the brain because the rest is already very well developed, I would say. If I can push that one, Martin, if you're going to comment on that, what about redundancy among the sensors? So, yeah, so I, w I was actually going to go, um, I, you know, it's a different talk, but I have a whole talk about resilient autonomous systems. And I say, we don't even know how to build resilient systems let alone resilient autonomous systems. <laughs> so, um, so I say, as an answer to your question, is that um, today and over the next couple of years, sensors are actually not the most expensive part of an autonomous vehicle. It's going to be the compute, and it's going to be the software and the compute. That's going to be 80% of the cost of the system. And I say, why the heck do we need to have all this compute on the vehicle. If we have the edge and we have 5G, get as much as you can off the, sys off the vehicle into the cloud, into the edge. Software becomes a lot cheaper. You can share the decision making between m a number of vehicles. What needs to be on the vehicle is safety. The job of the autonomous system on the vehicle is to provide safety in all situations, right? And that is where perception then becomes so so from the perception stack, so sensing, you know, the sensor alone is not enough. You need perception, which is part of the brain, but it's not the entire brain, right? The perception needs to understand, and so you want to predict. So I say anything that is below a second needs to be on the vehicle. Any decision you can make more than a second away, you can do off the vehicle, right? And that's how I see um, the system evolving. That's how I would design the future where I have thousands of autonomous vehicles in a fleet. I would want to have one decision-making module in the cloud that does the decision-making for all 1,000 vehicles and not all vehicles by themselves doing their own. Okay. Um, but that then becomes uh, a problem. So, so, you have to, so there are different ideas in a multi-agent peer-to-peer kind of system. You say, let's each agent decide by themselves. They communicate and they can optimize. Or you say, do we have a shared and we have kind of like a, a central control system that, that, uh, that does this. Uh, and it depends on the application. If I have a robo-taxi company, I probably want that central control system that does the decision-making for all my vehicles, and my vehicles just keep safe. Or could it be a different model yeah, that all okay. the vehicles and, at the intersection are under a control? Yeah, okay. That's hard to manage. And so, so, I was going to let you do your second question. Go ahead, you, quick. Thank you. I, I, I think it will be interesting. So I don't want to go to 26, 26, 26, and all other standards which define safety. But, but the question is, we're interested. So think about evolution from machine vision to deep neural nets. And so how are you moving from human pre-trained or predefined features into the world where the machine finds its own variables and, and you run and you build your neural net on, on whatever the machine believes is important for physical vision. 
And so think about chess programs, like people writing chess programs, assigning human weights, and then you let AlphaGo do whatever AlphaGo did, and then eventually uh, uh, kind of more deep learning methods. And so you see pretty drastic improvement in performance from systems programmed <coughs> and uh, comprehensible by human beings to the system which we don't know how to work. They, they, they work. We know inputs, but then it does something which we cannot explain and, and understand. It just does something and does really well. And so the question is, I understand from safety and security and, and automotive perspective, you want to have comprehensible systems. In terms of performance, there is a strong argument to say if you don't constrain the problem by it must be comprehensible, you can evolve a significantly better solution to, to the problem, to the step. Mm -hmm. And so how do you see, do you see it's happening in some countries? Say China will say, you know what, I don't care if it's comprehensible or not. I just measure the final output of the system. If it doesn't kill people, I'm fine with it. Why it doesn't pe kill people, I don't know. And you go to Germany, you'll say, no, no, no. I want to have back to back. I want to have sliced uh, neural nets. And I can partition it and say, this is where my problem is coming from. So how do you see the, the difference in philosophies and evolution based on your regulations and safety requirements. Martin, I think that one's for you. Well, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, it, it's not only, I, I think it's more about philosophy of how you develop, um, you know, resilient systems. Um, and, and so the thing, so my, my personal view, you know, as I said, if we cannot even build a 737, with an autonomous system for the pilot that doesn't crash, after 40 years of trying, right? Um, why do we think that we can do this so, you know, with autonomous vehicles without edge cases that are problematic? And it's in these edge cases where the, you know, the uh, the explainability needs to come in. Um, and so if everything goes fine, yeah, I don't need explainability. If I don't need to explain myself to the pedestrian, as you saw in my example, when the car needs to go across the double yellow line, and the rule is, of the road, is that you're not allowed to cross the double yellow line, and so therefore we say, from the regulation point of view, that the car needs to now have a human intervention. To Make say, the human break the law. <laughs> right, go or yeah. no go, right? Um, at that point, the human wants to know, why are you asking me this question? Right? What, what, what is it that you want me to do? So the, so the AI goes from being able to go around the car to explaining why it can't go around the car to the human. And so for those type of systems, we need explainable AI. And your deep, deep neural net will not be able to do that very well in the, in the near future. But if you never get into this problem, so if you have a society where it is OK to go then, yeah, we never need to explain, then maybe you're right. And, and what is the right answer, I think, depends on the philosophy you want to take about safety and the philosophy you want to take about, do we want socially acceptable autonomy? Or do we just want to have humans adapt to whatever autonomy we think is the right autonomy for you? And that is just a societal question, you know? If I need to watch out every time because I see an autonomous vehicle, I'm like, whoop, let that thing pass before I uh, dare. You know, and you think that is OK, then fine, we can do that. Um, but I think in the Western world, you know, in certain cities, <laughs> like San Francisco, that's not going to fly. So anyway, yeah, so yeah, I, 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 I also want to caution re real quickly, because we heard this example again from chess computers and, and AlphaGo and so on. And then quite often the story goes, look, they can do it in chess and to play Go, why can you not just have a car drive these incredible machines? I really want to caution everyone, because there's a fundamental difference between playing a however complex board game and traffic just on this campus. And that's the difference between a super huge number and infinity. And of course, safety and everything. But even if you take Go, which I have to admit, I don't play Go. I don't know how to play it, but I know how to play chess. It's a huge number of different variations where all the different figures can be black and white and whatnot. But it's a finite number. And it applies fantastically well to a computer to run 
probably it some sort of AI. Interact. It doesn't even it know it's act, playing. But, but you can, somebody. if you have a super <laughs> fast computer, you can calculate all these different variations. That doesn't apply in traffic. Yeah. It would only be the same thing if the, the king in, on the white field just moves just a little millimeter to the left which might maybe show the intent where the king might move. And then you want to calculate all this. And maybe the king is turned a little bit. <laughs> if that matters, because all of this matters in driving with those examples that I gave earlier. Therefore, I want to caution a little bit. It's important to have these discussions, but it only applies to some extent. OK. I've seen a number of hands, but I saw yours first. Go ahead. Um, hi. I uh, really appreciate the perspectives. I actually worked on Tesla Autopilot in 2016, and I'm a kind of curious what the discussion would be like if we had someone from the CS department here today. Um, kind of curious to hear your thoughts on your presentation with, with respect to whether you, what you're proposing is something that you believe is fundamentally the right way for the long term so what, implementation of self-driving cars or whether you think that this is kind of like a stopgap solution because you think that um, I guess like general AI is kind of like long, long enough away from where we are today that it makes sense to invest as a business, as a commercial enterprise, into a pretty huge infrastructure project, I would say. Are you asking me? Yeah, I'm not curious because, like, to me, what you've presented, and as you say, there's some limitations with like the amount of um, data you need to pipe to the central command command system, and that's a lot of infrastructure investment. So, does that infrastructure investment make sense if, for example, a, a car-based AI can drive in the next <coughs> five years? 10 years or 20 years? Yeah, I mean, that's, so I, I think it's a great question. And um, I'm a very pragmatic person. Uh, so if I think, uh, if, you know, the industry has kind of been saying that we were getting autonomous, fully autonomous vehicles in the next five years for the last 20 years. <laughs> Maybe that's a little <coughs> exaggeration, but for the last 10 years. Um, and, and we're not there. Um, and I, I don't see us to be there in the next five years. Maybe in, in very, um, you know, certain areas, very limited, uh, you know, and, and then it, it's going to be, you know, minimal. Um, so that's why I think it's, it's, it's a stopgap, but not really, because, you know, my example of the 737 MAX, you know, that after 45 years of autopilot, in the cockpit, um, you know, we suddenly have an incredible, you know, two plane crashes that were pretty, pretty dramatic. And if you look at how these, wh what happened, you know, it's not that we don't know how to build these systems safely. We do, or they do, but the pressures, it's organizational pressures that came that made the system, you know, the way it was, and and the crash actually happened. Um, so I'm just. I'm just somebody who thinks we never have autonomous systems completely safe enough that we don't need humans in the loop. That's just my, my, my strong belief. Um, and and if, I can, if I can follow up with a question on that, though, so partial autonomy has its own dangers. Of course. If, if your car is going to send a decision to you and you have to react within a second and you're kind of spaced out, much less asleep at the wheel, right. you know, um, isn't that even more dangerous? Yeah, yeah. we got a Tesla expert here. So. <laughs> <laughs> we no, can't return yeah, that yeah, question. Yeah, I mean, so, so, so that's why I'm saying it's hard, yeah. right? It's yeah. really hard. Um, so yeah, so, so that's what my solution is, a human supervisor, just like air traffic control. And, you know, believe me, the, the, the aerospace industry has been trying for decades to try to put more autonomy in the cockpit. Right? And, and now they're working on free flight and, you know, and they're trying to, to so, so what they've done, if they, they have said, okay, fly three miles apart, you know, from top to bottom and, you know, so that if something goes wrong, we have time to react. Um, and so if, so if we are willing to do that on the road, you know, maybe we can, we can make it uh, safer, but I don't think, so other people say, well, let 
get the damn pedestrians off the road, right? <laughs> you know, this, I saw a simulation of MIT. It's like, oh, if we just, you know, cars are driving, you know, we don't need traffic lights anymore. And then you look at the simulation, like, there's no people in the simulation. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. like, you know, what, 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 what utopia is this? You know, it's like, but I mean, so this is, we have, we, we will have people on the road. And so I, so I think it's going to take, if we take the, the step you're taking, it's going to take a long time before industry will be willing to take the risk of putting autonomous, fully autonomous vehicle on the road. Sven, comments on this? Yeah, I, I really appreciate then the question about um, infrastructure. And my answer is those who say autonomous have to say infrastructure in the same sentence. Otherwise, I don't think how it's going to work. And I, I find it peculiar. Uh, and, and you brought up if we had someone from the CS department here, and I do know that com computer scientists, by and large, feel that it should be all self-contained. It should be a really autonomous system, which means it doesn't need anything else to, to um, fulfill its mission or its task and everything. And I understand the appeal, because infrastructure um, is huge investments, which you said. And, and just to give some reference, 50% of the road infrastructure in the United States today is underfunded. That means we have only enough budget to fix 50% of the bridges and to fill 50% of the potholes and to stripe 50% of the lane markings that need to be striped. And now we're not even talking about using any of this communication infrastructure for autonomous vehicles. And still, I find it surprising if especially computer scientists, and I will say that, argue for the case of not connecting automobiles, highly safety critical systems, where we are connecting everything else. We are connecting obviously laptops, we're connecting watches, we're connecting refrigerators, we're connecting the switches to our light in the living room, and everything is connected. But the automobile would do without? I'm not quite sure if we're leading the right discussion there. Mm -hmm. And what might be part of it, um, I've been thinking about this quite a bit, because autonomous driving is such a vast topic, again, it's not getting from automobile 1.0 to automobile 2.0. We are reinventing traffic as we know it. And very often we see the brightest minds on the planet focusing on very specific things. Maybe figuring out with artificial intelligence how I can do an unprotected left turn or how I can do a laser scanner that even can detect the nose in like whatever 400 feet distance. And once we get this and we say, we got a step forward, but we still don't know how many steps we need to take to actually have a fully autonomous car. And the last thing I will say to this, I think it's maybe in a picture that might resonate with the audience. Uh, Steve Schladover told me this, he's from UC Berkeley really amazing researcher in the field of autonomous vehicles. If you want to go up on Mount Everest, and you are here in San Francisco Bay Area, you basically get on a plane, you fly to London, you switch planes, fly into Kathmandu, you get out of the airport, someone takes you to the first base camp to go up uh, on Mount Everest. And maybe by distance or number of steps, maybe you covered what, 90, 95%. But this is really then when the challenge begins. And this is when you figure out if you make it or not up there. And this might be roughly where we are. Maybe we made it to the second or third base camp, and I have no okay. idea how many there are going up on, on uh, Mount Everest. But it's not linear where we say, we've come, come this far, therefore, what you say, in five years we will be able to do it. OK, I, I, I want to do one more question. Yeah, let, let me just make one, one comment quick. It's a quick comment. I only know one uh, really good autonomous system. It's called a human being. <laughs> right? We don't do stuff alone. We collaborate. Mm -hmm. And we communicate in order to collaborate. Right? So to think that autonomous systems are not need, don't need to collaborate and interact mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. others mm -hmm. is, is just, uh, to my okay. understanding, a farce. Thank you. One last question, and it's yours, back in the back. No, you, you, it's you. Second. Yeah. Uh, do you have any suggestions about how to approach the ethics of identifying individual differences like attire or race or class or gender uh, when making autonomous systems? The, the ethics, say, say, say more about what you uh, mean with so, the uh, like so You mentioned about identifying different kind of group affiliations through clothing. Uh, can you expand a little bit more on the different ethical considerations that go into defining like different uh -huh. groups of people? 
it's a, it's a, it's a big debate. <laughs> this, this, this topic uh, of ethics for autonomous vehicles, I, I heard about it for the first, I want to say, eight or nine years ago, which relatively soon after the discussion around the legal aspects of autonomous driving, we got into ethics of autonomous driving. Actually, there's a, there's a class here on Stanford lectured by Professor Chris Gerdes and Dr. Stephen Zapf, and they, they lecture on the ethics of autonomous cars. And... Um, once we are there, that we can actually distinguish safely enough between one person and another, that would be far out. And I don't know if actually, or how a system should make this decision, because it could still be wrong. And I've been in many discussions where I said, you know what, if these are your only two options, like the 80-year-old school kid or the 80-year-old grandmother, by the way, my mom is 80. If you make these decisions, that means you were too fast a while ago. Because of your only two options hitting to kill someone, that means you were overestimating your skills and underestimating the risk. And you will kill someone. And still, someone then told me, well, Sven, you're not getting it. You're an engineer. You don't understand it. <laughs> and it was a uh, philosopher, a PhD, actually, in philosophy. It's important that we're having this discussion. It's not if we find a solution. So therefore, the ethics matter a lot, because now we really design systems that will make decisions on someone's behalf with all the consequences. And therefore, we need to have the discussion. But until we get to the point that we can differentiate between like age of a person, race probably will need to be discussed. And in, in spring, actually, there were news uh, on the web that these automated vehicles uh, cannot detect people of color as well as they can detect middle-aged white men. Martin, any last comments? Well, Which yeah. is the <laughs> color thing. <laughs> yeah. So uh, doesn't have to do anything with race. But, but the outcome... Yeah. So the, to me, the, the ethics question... You know, an autonomous vehicle is just a manifestation of today's machine learning capabilities. So, um, you know, ethics are, you know, the problem with ethical decisions are t here today. I mean, um, if we can dis distinguish a cat from a dog, you know, we, we, we start having a problem if machines can start doing that. And we need to discuss that. It's not just autonomous vehicles. It's your, your, your Apple camera. Right or your Samsung camera will soon make these kind of ethical decisions if we would let them. So it's really a debate that, as as, as Sven says, that is is larger than just autonomous vehicles. That doesn't mean that it isn't important. That's why I had the privacy slide on there, right? Because if if they become persuasive, um, and, and the person from Tesla already knows he takes camera, you know, images all over the place. I mean. So, so companies need to have, you know, I work with my startup in, in, in healthcare, and there we have the HIPAA, you know, rule, right? And we need to be HIPAA compliant if we store, you know, private information, healthcare information in the cloud. Why, why don't we have that for other stuff, right? I mean, so, so, so these are the kind of things that I think we need to really think about and grapple about. And, and that is, A, a societal question, a uh, legal question. And Europe is different than the United States, is different than China. Uh, I don't think this question is so much problem in China. You walk into China and you will body be body scanned today. And you know, um, so it, it, it depends on where, where your uh, tolerance is for, for ethics and for privacy. And I think uh, our culture will change because of these technologies. But it's not autonomous vehicles. It's the machine learning people you need to ask the question to. Okay, so we've got some refreshments outside to encourage continuing the conversation for a little bit. Please ask your questions after that, but if you would, please join me in thanking Sven and Martin for a great question. <laughs>